Sounds good. Welcome everybody to our Open Borders Legal Discussion. Uh, my name is Fabio Rojas. I teach sociology at Indiana University. This discussion on the legal foundations of open borders and immigration law is co-sponsored by the Free Migration Project, which is a nonprofit organization in the Philadelphia area that promotes education and advocacy on behalf of immigrants and immigrant rights. Uh, what is open borders? I'd like to take a moment just to uh, start with a brief summary of what the position is and what we'll be talking about. Currently, it is very hard to immigrate uh, to the United States specifically and to most other countries. There are usually long wait times, uh, paperwork that needs to be done. It's often very difficult. There are fees. It's very difficult in order for people to migrate between countries, especially to the US. And in response to that, some people have advocated the position of open borders, which essentially means to create a legal regime or set of rules that would greatly facilitate immigration to make it very easy to uh, reduce or perhaps even abolish things like visas and passports. And the idea is to um, make immigration legal and to remove punishment and enforcement of immigration violations. Uh, this is a interesting idea, one that I've long had a passion for. And so I'm very grateful that we have two most excellent guests here to talk about the legal foundations of open borders. Before I introduce them, there are a couple housekeeping notes that I would like to put out there. Uh, before we start the discussion. Number one, we are recording this discussion. This is being recorded. So if you say something, please know that the internet in its entirety will hear it. All six billion people on this planet will hear it. Um, number two, if you've been following the emails, we initially said we would broadcast this on YouTube, but due to some technical issues, we're actually broadcasting it on Facebook. So if you have any friends who are trying to log in through YouTube, please tell them to switch to the free migration project uh, uh, Facebook page where we're broadcasting this. Uh, number three, please mute yourself. Keep yourself on mute. Um, having a lot of people, we have a lot of RSVPs for today's event. So if everybody talks at the same time, it's simply very difficult to handle. So please keep yourself on mute. Please hold your comments until the Q&A. So this will be the half discussion, half Q&A. And then we're going to ask people to type in comments into the chat box and then David Benyon, who is the founder and uh, chair of the Free Migration Project, will read questions out loud and will moderate the discussion. And then we'll wrap this up by 2 o'clock. So without uh, further ado, let me introduce our two most excellent guests. Uh, our first guest is Professor Daniel I. Morales. He is a scholar and theorist of immigration law. His research addresses the legal problems that arise because immigration law acts on non-citizens yet is made by and for the citizen group. His scholarship has appeared in leading law reviews such as the NYU Law Review, the Indiana Law Journal, and the Wake Forest Law Review. He began his career as a William H. Hasty Fellow at the University of Wisconsin Law School and subsequently clerked for the Honorable Guy Cole Jr. of the Sixth, District, Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals and the Honorable Joan B. Gottschall of the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Illinois he received his JD from the Yale Law School and a BA in Magna Cum Laude from Williams College. Ilya Soman is a professor of law at George Mason University. His research focuses on constitutional law, property law, democratic theory, federalism, and migration rights. He is the author of Free to Move, Foot Voting Migration, Political Freedom, which is very interesting. I just finished reading that this weekend. It's a very interesting book, uh, Democracy and Political Ignorance, Why Smaller Government is Better and The Grasping Hand, Kilo versus City of New London and the Limits of Eminent Domain. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna ask our panel just a couple of basic questions. They have prepared comments. And then after we do the questions and the prepared comments, we'll do the comments through the chat box. So I think Ilya uh, suggested he wanted to go first. The basic issue is why is it so hard to immigrate? What is the legal doctrine behind our immigration restrictions? What's the story there? So I'd like to start by thanking Fabio and the Free Migration Project for organizing this event and uh, Dan Morales for what I know will be some insightful comments on, on his part and all of you for uh, coming. In my very short presentation, I'd just like to talk about uh, a couple of things. One is sort of what are the legal foundations for the current immigration regime, which as Fabio says is 
highly restrictive and has gotten even more restrictive, of course, uh, in the last few months. Uh, second, uh, also what, if anything, can be done to reform it. Uh, so I think uh, our immigration restriction system has two important legal pillars. The first is the idea that the federal government has the structural authority to restrict immigration. That is, Congress can pass laws and often the president can just adopt regulations or executive orders that bar people from coming in. Uh, and this is the so-called plenary power doctrine that was adopted by the Supreme Court in the uh, Chinese exclusion cases in 1889. It's worth noting that there is not actually any passage or line or text in the constitution which specifically says that the federal government has the power to restrict immigration. And that's not because this was considered a really minor thing uh, and the constitution only lists very major powers. They actually list a lot of even fairly minor things, much less important than this one, such as the power to set uh, uh, weights and measures and the power to establish post roads and others. Uh, and indeed, for much of the first century of American history, the dominant, though certainly not the exclusive view, was that the federal government did not actually have a general power to restrict immigration. This was the position held by James Madison, and Thomas Jefferson, and many others during the founding era. It's why they opposed uh, the Alien Acts of 1798, which were uh, successfully eventually terminated uh, when Jefferson became president. Uh, so to my mind, although there was a big debate on this, to my mind, under the original meaning of the Constitution and the text, there is not a general power to restrict immigration in the hands of the federal government. State governments might have some such power, but not the federal government. However, since at least 1889, the Supreme Court has held that there is such a power. Uh, when they held it, they did not say, well, we inferred a power from a particular part of the Constitution or a particular other power that is given to the federal government. Rather, they said, well, this is just an inherent power uh, that all sovereign nations must have. So essentially, it's got to be in there somewhere. Uh, and I should note that, as you can tell from the name Chinese exclusion case, uh, this uh, decision arose from uh, a very deep hostility to Chinese immigration and other Asian immigration to US, often racially motivated. Uh, so it was a product of that era. But I think it's unlikely, at least in the near uh, to medium term future, that the Chinese exclusion case is going to get overruled. Uh, there is a second pillar to uh, the existing restriction system, which is uh, the idea that not only does Congress and the president have the power to restrict migration, but that power for the most part is not limited by individual rights and some other provisions which generally limit other federal powers, for instance, uh, limitations on discrimination on the basis of race, religion, uh, political views, and the like. All of these have been used in immigration law in contexts in which they would be struck down in most other contexts. The most recent example, of course, was uh, the 2018 decision in the Trump travel ban case, where in almost any other area of law, if there was this blatant evidence of religious discriminatory motive, as there was in this case, the court would almost certainly have struck it down. But in this case, they said because it's immigration and the courts owe special deference to government in the immigration context, uh, then you know, they, they would uphold it here. I think this doctrine also has little support, if any, in the text and original meaning of the Constitution. It is also very much a product of the late 19th century Jim Crow era when the courts were generally, for the most part, at least fairly differential to racial and ethnic and other kinds of discriminatory classifications by the state and federal government. Most of the rest of the judicial legacy of this era has fortunately been swept away, but the immigration part has only been partially chipped away at and is mostly uh, still in place. Uh, and this extends not just to discrimination, but also to such things as due process in immigration cases, for example, deportation and immigration detention are subject to much less in the way of due process and other procedural protections than other similarly grave deprivations of liberty. Uh, the Supreme Court unfortunately just reinforced this in a 7-2 decision uh, dealing with habeas corpus and migration where they further affirmed that uh, immigration detention can be done in situations where most other kinds of detention to be forbidden. Ironically, the standards for detention of, of peaceful immigrants trying to enter the United States 
are now much lower than the standards for detention of suspected terrorists at Guantanamo under the Supreme Court's Guantanamo decisions. This is how much of a, uh, an exception the immigration uh, restrictions are as compared to other areas of law. Now, what can be done about this? I think relatively little in the short term can be done about the general power to exclude uh, in terms of getting the Supreme Court to cut that back and rethink the Chinese exclusion cases. I would like to see this done at some point in the future, but I think there is, I, I doubt there's even one justice on the Supreme Court currently who would want to do it in any significant way. And we are a long way away from uh, being able to do much about that. I think there is, on the other hand, certainly scope for legislative reform in terms of breaking down some of the barriers. I also think that, uh, as I outlined more fully in a recent article in The Atlantic, some of the delegations of exclusionary authority to Congress has given to the president can be challenged based on the so-called non-delegation doctrine, which is a doctrine which says there's a limit to how much legislative authority Congress can delegate to the executive. Essentially, uh, under the law under which Trump has now adopted a near total ban on legal immigration and previously his, his more restrictive travel bans, the Supreme Court uh, has essentially interpreted that law as giving the president the power to ban almost any alien from entering the US for almost any reason. If there's any violation of the non-delegation doctrine anywhere, then this has to be an example of it. So uh, I think a legal challenge might be possible on that basis. I don't guarantee that it will succeed, but it could be possible. I also think that there is room uh, to cut back the second part of the plenary power doctrine, the idea that it's immigration restrictions are largely unconstrained by individual rights provision of the Constitution. We saw in the travel ban decision for Supreme Court justice being willing to uh, rethink this in a significant way. Uh, so I think there, there is potential for that. But ultimately, I think what you want to do with a constitutional reform movement of this kind is to combine legal and political action. It's not either you do litigation or you engage in political action, past successful constitutional reform movements have almost always done both. You see this with the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, the gun rights movement, in recent years, the property rights movement. There are many other examples. Virtually all of them have this characteristic that when they make progress, they have mutually reinforcing uh, litigation strategies on the one hand and political strategies on the other. Uh, and I can talk more in the questions uh, about some ways that that can be done. Uh, so I thank you for your time and I turn it over for to Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think um, I, I agree fully with the picture Ilya has drawn of the state of things. Um, I think one way to characterize immigration law is to say that it doesn't look very democratic. In other words, it doesn't look like law in other areas. It looks far more like what a sort of 18th century king had the right to do to his subjects than it does other forms of law that we associate with um, democratic law and adjudication. So um, what I want to do with my five minutes is suggest that there were other possibilities in the Constitution at the founding um, and that those possibilities have sort of been lost um, and so I want to sort of lay the groundwork for a kind of recovery of certain values um, at the founding um, that we've lost sight of. Um, so I want to suggest some lost legal foundations for open borders. So in 1793, a few short years after ratification of the Constitution, a case came before the Supreme Court that posed what sounds like a dry question that's totally irrelevant to immigration, but I want you to bear with me and I'll tie it together. The question was whether the state of Georgia could be sued in federal court by an out-of-state citizen, Chisholm of South Carolina, who was the executor of an estate um, in that state. Um, so what sounds um, like a dull procedural question actually precipitated this remarkable disquisition by the justices on the nature of sovereignty, hierarchy, and law. Um, and this, uh, these disquisitions were by two founders. Um, so I want to focus on two quotations from that opinion that I think um, I'm going to suggest are relevant to some of the questions that immigration law now poses. So the first is from James Wilson. He wrote um, in uh, his opinion on, in Chisholm v. Georgia, quote, 
The only reason I believe why a free man is bound by human laws is that he binds himself. The second is from John Jay. Um, quote, will it be said that the 50 odd thousand citizens in Delaware being associated under a state government stand in rank so superior to the 40 odd thousand of Philadelphia? In this land of equal liberty shall 40 odd thousand in one place be um, uh, compelled to do justice and yet 50 odd thousand in another place be privileged to do justice only as they think as they may think proper. Now, Grant, the governor of Delaware, holds an office of superior rank to the mayor of Philadelphia, but they are both nonetheless officers of the people. And however more exalted one may be than the other, yet in the opinion of those who dislike aristocracy, the circumstance cannot be a good reason for impeding the course of justice. So I think both of these principles are actually quite radical, um, and they've been excised over the centuries from our constitutional tradition in favor of principles like unchecked sovereignty over American borders that I think have more to do with our, the sort of more general monarchical history of nation states than they do with the revolutionary ideas of the founding, which are that we the people, not any entity of government, are sovereign. Um, so what I want to imagine for a second is what if these, what if there was this alternative universe where these two principles, which I'll call quote radical consent. And then the other principle, which I'll call um, equal dignity of populations. What if constitutional law had developed those over the centuries rather than the alternative that they've developed? And, you know, how does that tie into immigration and the sovereignty exercise over immigrants? All right. So let's take radical consent first. So a woman standing at the border, persecuted in the nation of her birth, has she, quote, to use John Jay's words, a free man bound herself to the border's, quote, human laws? Has she consented to the laws that exclude her from the United States? I think not. Um, so then I think the question becomes, how can she be illegal under that theory of radical consent if she crosses into US borders in defiance of our human laws. So I don't think she can be. And I think one um, sort of extrapolation from the, the sort of radical theory of consent that um, Jay puts forward is that had we followed that path, um, she could not be excluded, right? And so, you know, to, to put a sort of note on it, right? So per Chisholm v. Georgia decided in 1793 and extrapolated to 2020, Hashtag no one is illegal. So now I want to talk about the dignity of populations. So here, this is the idea that the state of Delaware, with about the same population as the city of Philadelphia, should not enjoy immunity from being sued by a citizen of another state just because it's a state. What does that have to do with immigration? Well, you may have heard of sanctuary cities, right? These are places in the United States where super majorities of citizen populations, frankly, about as much consensus as can exist in these times, believes that undocumented people are entitled to remain in city limits, relatively unmolested by federal authorities. Um, attacks on these sanctuary policies of non-cooperation have come from the national government, where the malapportionment of the Senate guarantees that control over immigration law is uh, the dom is basically controlled by states with the fewest number of immigrants and potentially the fewest number of citizens. Attacks on sanctuary cities have also come from state governments like Texas and North Carolina, which have, in my view, curtailed undemocratically the autonomy of their population centers like Austin and Dallas and Raleigh and Chapel Hill. And these states have done this to act on the desires of um, uh, of their rural populations, um, which are less numerous than their urban population. So um, I think both sorts of attacks from the national government and from state governments might be thought to defy, um, again, with centuries of uh, development that didn't happen, um, the norm that John Jay articulated, right? That Delaware should not get aristocratic type treatment vis-a-vis -a, -vis a place of equal population just because Delaware is a state and another population center is contained in a city. 
Um, this kind of privilege, I think, is aristocratic in the kind of way that Jay was articulating. And aristocracy and its obsession with hierarchy and special privileges for different categories of people was in fact one of the main things that the Revolutionary War set out to abolish. And mainstream um, historians like Gordon Wood have said, um, one of the things that the United States has accomplished better than anything else is the abolition of aristocracy, at least in the social, uh, in the legal realm. Um, so Jay, uh, I think, put state immunity from suit in that category. Um, and I think um, had constitutional law followed this path rather than veered off it, similar objections to state anti-sanctuary policies um, would be um, um, readily available. Um, so, so that's my uh, little contribution. I welcome questions. Thank and you very thank much. You to, to everybody for putting this on. No, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Here's our uh, next question, which is, People who are interested in open borders or liberalizing migration will point to, say, sanctuary cities, as you mentioned, or as Ilya mentioned, constitutional reform of some type. In your opinion, what are the promising areas for open borders advocates? So uh, maybe we could do the reverse order. Maybe Daniel can say a few things and Ilya can say a few things. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think the sanctuary cities are a place to start, right? Um, I think my view is that um, the, the conversation about open borders and the political movement that um, Ilya articulated as being necessary to sort of move towards a liberalization of migration ought to be a bottom-up project. Um, and I think sanctuary cities are kind of indicative of, of, of why that may be so, right? Um, I think given um, you know, the fact that uh, immigration law is so exclusionary, I think it's really remarkable that there are population centers, and you know, a lot of people criticize sanctuary cities, they're not really sanctuaries, et cetera, et cetera. But in part, that's simply because the federal government hasn't allowed them the autonomy to be sanctuaries that they could be, right? I think the reality is, you know, if we're talking about major population centers, liberal migration has a ton of support. And in fact, um, among the population as a whole. There's a lot of support for immigration. You know, the, the national government's perspective on immigration right now is completely opposed um, to what the people themselves actually believe about immigration. So in my view, um, I think um, deepening, you know, things like um, cities and states kind of moving towards voting rights for non-citizens is a way of kind of building a, a sort of no borders um, uh, proof of concept. Um, and so, so I see that roll up, right? So we have a lot of sanctuary cities in red states and blue states, um, but we have some blue states too. And I think those have developed again, like California, Illinois is one where um, sort of the state, the city, the population centers in the state kind of um, presage these norms that the larger state adopts. And you could see the same thing happening at the national level where, you know, once we have uh, uh, enough sanctuary states, we'll see a national co consolidation of liberalization. So that's my, um, those are my ideas. I'd love to hear from Ilya. Thank you. So I, I think some overlap plus some additional points I, I'm certainly a fan of sanctuary cities. And in fact, last year I wrote an article in the Texas Law Review, which goes over the sanctuary city litigation the last several years, which sanctuary cities have actually mostly prevailed on against the Trump administration, with, with just a few exceptions. Also the sanctuary state legislation in California and now some other states as well, which again, with a few exceptions, have mostly prevailed. Though it's important also to recognize the limits of this, which is that what most of these cases are about is not the states protecting people against federal immigration enforcers like IC going in, it's just a state saying, we're not gonna help you guys. And often that's very important because in the US we have many more state law enforcement agencies and state government officials than we do ICE agents or other uh, federal officials. So often if the state doesn't help, that means it's harder to catch and deport people, but it's not by any means a complete protection. Second, along the same lines, I would urge the idea of state or even locality-based uh, visas, uh, which is an idea actually that exists in Canada and Australia. 
And uh, Joe Biden and other Democratic presidential candidates have advocated for this. So too have some congressional Republicans as well. Their proposals went nowhere in the last couple of years, but I think there is a possibility of this being enacted uh, and it's not perfect. It might initially mean that the person has to stay for a number of years in a particular state. Uh, but over time, there can be a path there to uh, ending there uh, without limitation. I think it's also better than the current H-1B visa program, which is largely suspended. But even when operating, it essentially tied an immigrant to a particular employer, uh, which is bad both for the person in that they don't have a free choice of where to work, but it's bad for the economy as well in that um, uh, we want people to flow to those employers who would be most effective, not to the one where they happen to get the first job. Very few people in this day and age work for the same employer for their entire career, and you know, we shouldn't require that to, to occur. Uh, then I mentioned earlier the path of chipping away at the doctrine that uh, other constitutional limitations and government power don't apply to immigration, and I think there is room to do that for both litigation and legislation. Uh, it should proceed, I think, along both kinds of tracks. And as a, a sort of, uh, I'm not an expert in public relations strategy, but I think there's a couple points that are worth emphasizing. One is, if we as a nation say we don't believe in racial, ethnic, or religious discrimination, then we should ask, how can we make a giant exception for immigration policy? We even have a policy sanctioned by the federal government, not just under the Trump administration, but under the Obama administration as well, which says that within any quote unquote border areas, uh, uh, law enforcement agencies can use racial and ethnic profiling uh, in immigration. You might say, well, that's just border areas. But if you look at how they define border areas, it's any area within 100 miles of a land border or 100 miles of the sea, which includes areas where two thirds of the population of the United States lives. Uh, so uh, you should ask, well, why should we have a giant exception to the principles we generally accept in other areas uh, for immigration policy. There is then also the broader point, which I don't fully agree with everything that Dan said about sovereignty and democracy, but I do, I think, agree with this point that uh, the American Revolution and modern liberal democracy generally is inimical to the idea of aristocratic privilege. That is that you should have special legal rights based on who your parents are. If your parents are lords or barons or whatever, then you have one set of rights, but if your parents are commoners or worse still serfs, uh, then you have another set. The American Revolution was fought against that, but the system of immigration restrictions that currently exists is itself a system of aristocratic privilege. Uh, uh, essentially, where you're allowed to live and work to a large extent depends on who your parents were. Were your parents US citizens or also what location you happen to be born? To my mind, that's not much different from saying my dad was a lord and therefore I have one set of rights. And if your dad was a peasant, you have another set. I'm not sure if there's a big difference between that and saying I was born, I actually wasn't, but uh, somebody was born north of the Rio Grande and another person is born south of it. And therefore, uh, you know, they chose the wrong place to be born. And so there should be a different set of rights there. And this broader, more radical principle I think is a tougher sell than simply saying, let's not engage in racial discrimination, let's not engage in religious discrimination and so forth. But I think uh, history has shown that pointing out this, the common humanity between people can be a success, successfully drive a reform movement. It's how reform movements for racial equality work. It's how reform movements for gay and lesbian equality have had a lot of success in recent years. What they said essentially is that there's not a fundamental difference between say same sex marriage and opposite sex marriage are ultimately similar things and should be allowed. Similarly, uh, the idea was that you know, ultimately the color of your skin should not be relevant to what kinds of rights you have. And similarly, I think also we can hopefully can realize the principle that the, the identity of your parents or the location where you're born uh, should not uh, determine your rights. 100% agree with Elia, and I actually wrote an article analogizing undocumented immigrants to American revolutionaries that made precisely that point that, um, that the greatest aristocracy in the world right now is the aristocracy of citizens of the rich world and their exclusionary practices, which sort of exercise those privileges of exclusion uh, against others. So absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Those are really great comments. And this leads to uh, our next question, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So please hold your questions 
for the comment box, which will open after this question. So each of our speakers has some very interesting scholarship and writing that you could check out. Uh, Ilya has a book on foot boating or foot moving, and uh, Daniel has a series. Yes, so you will get a chance to uh, promote that. Please lift it up again when you uh, when you come on screen. Uh, and then Daniel has uh, a forthcoming book he should talk about, and also a series of articles. I'm sorry, did I get that wrong? Articles. That it's okay. <laughs> uh, articles. I'm sorry. Forthcoming articles. He has a series of articles on reframing immigration. So maybe Ilya, do you want to first uh, uh, promote your book and tell us a little bit about it? Then Daniel can tell us about his recent writings on reframing immigration. Sure. So my book is called Freedom Move. Foot Voting, Migration, and Political Freedom. Uh, you can see it here, but it's also available on Find Amazon and other electronic outlets near you. Uh, and the basic uh, point of the book is that the ability to vote with your feet is an important component of political freedom and in many ways more valuable than voting at the ballot box. When you vote at the ballot box, like in the current presidential election that's coming up, in most cases, you have only a tiny chance of actually making a difference as to what policies you will live under, approximately one in 60 million in a presidential election. Uh, and as a result of that, you also have very little incentive to be well informed about the issues at stake. And indeed, the data on the show that most of the public know very little about the issues because uh, what's the point of learning a lot if there's still very little chance that your knowledge will make a difference. When you vote with your feet, as in deciding what state or city to live in or what country to live in if you voted for your feet internationally, you have a much better chance of your decision making a difference. And for that very reason, uh, you also have a much better incentive to make a well-informed decision. And so in the book, I discuss various ways to expand opportunities for people to vote with your feet, both domestically and internationally. The whole point of this book is to bring foot voting domestically together with the international version, even though usually these are two largely separate literatures. And indeed, usually you have the political right saying, well, we really like domestic foot voting. We <laughs> trumpet how people may be leaving more big government states to move to states like Texas, which uh, have relatively less regulation. But if it's instead of Californians moving to Texas, it's Mexicans moving to Texans or Guatemalans, that's terrible. You know, we can't have that. And the left often has the opposite set of attitudes. They're very suspicious of domestic foot voting, but much more welcoming of the international kind. In reality, in the book, I discuss how there's a, a, a deep similarity between these types of foot voting and how it can be mutually reinforcing. I also, in the book, deal with a wide range of objections to expanded migration rights, both ones which say, well, certain governments have an inherent right to exclude for any reason they want, and ones which say we need to exclude people to address specific types of problems, such as overburdening the welfare state, damaging the environment. Uh, my book uh, was written before the uh, COVID-19 crisis, but I think much of my framework applies to uh, the COVID-based migration restrictions that have been enacted uh, as well. So that's sort of basically uh, the nutshell uh, view of what's in the book. Outstanding, uh, Daniel. Yeah, I look forward to reading Ilya's book, and I'm a big fan of his uh, foot boating uh, foot boating li uh, literature. Um, so, I've been, uh, you know, I wrote a piece a while back called "Crimes of Migration," arguing that um, that uh, immigration crimes um, are illegitimate um, under sort of any theory of the criminal law, um, and um, you know, I I've happily seen that there's been a, a movement towards decriminalization of migration, uh, most prominently put forward by um, some uh, candidates for uh, president um, on the Democratic Party. Um, and so I'm continuing in that sort of vein to try and do some sort of fundamental undermining of the legal theories um, that uphold immigration restriction. And so I'm working on a piece called The People's Immigration Power that um, is, is, is based on some of my, um, what I talked about earlier. But, but the basic idea is that the way, the, the, way, the place the Supreme Court really went wrong um, in its immigration jurisprudence was in kind of fixing the immigration power at the national level. And that in fact, over time, I think we've seen that more flexibility in the allocation of immigration powers. Um, here, I think at this point in time, to um, 
to, to uh, states or localities um, is in fact sort of a better outcome and a more democratic outcome in a variety of ways. So uh, like Ilya, I'm a fan of decentralization of the immigration power. Uh, I, I love the idea of local and uh, state visas and have been a proponent of that myself. Additionally, you know, I would say one other um, thing to consider is, and this also happens in Canada, which is um, the expansion and return to private sponsorship of, um, of immigrants. Um, in Canada, you can, as a group, get together if you raise X amount of money, sponsor asylum seekers from other countries. And I think what that does um, is develop a politics of, of pro-immigration. And I think that sort of foundation for a, a pro-immigration politics is really important, right? Because as it stands now, people sitting outside the United States can't vote except with their feet if we let them in, right? But if the movement's to succeed, I think from the bottom up, I think we need to re find reforms that can kind of endogenize demand and comfort with immigration. And I think state and local visas are in that category, as are private sponsorships of asylees. Um, so anyway, so I'm, I'm writing about that and trying to find um, roads not taken in constitutional jurisprudence that are radical um, and that uh, might lay a foundation um, for um, sort of a broader rethinking of um, immigration as an exclusive sovereign national power. Thank you very much. So what we're going to do now is we're going to open up the chat box to uh, questions and comments. And then David Benyon, who is our leader at the Free Migration Project, will help moderate that. And while we're waiting for the first comments to uh, appear in the chat box, uh, I'll just make a few notes and then I'll ask the panel one short question. Uh, but so uh, every year, the Free Migration Project co-sponsors an Open Borders Conference. We hope to start announcing details on that later this summer. Daniel and Ilya were very kind to participate in previous iterations, versions of the Open Borders Conference. Uh, so we'll be announcing that. We have a Facebook called Open Borders Action Group, where we just have kind of news stories about immigration, discussions of immigration, and news about events that you could join. Uh, once again, if your friends miss this particular event, this will be recorded and it'll be on Facebook and YouTube. So uh, one thing I wanted to ask while we wait for the first comments to start uh, trickling in is um, tell me more about local visas. I got to be honest that that's not something I know about and it never occurred to me until you even mentioned it. And uh, tell me a little bit more about that. What are the issues? What's the origin of that? Oh, yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll go first and Dan, who might know more about some of the technical details than I do, actually can follow up. Uh, so this is not a new idea. Indeed, during the first century of American history, states actually had the primary role in deciding which aliens to let in and which not to. Uh, the federal government had citizenship legislation, but uh, people who were not citizens could and did uh, uh, enter states who were willing to take them. Uh, and uh, sometimes they can even become state citizens without becoming citizens of the United States. Uh, so uh, more recently, it, it has been used in countries like Canada and Australia, where essentially a, a, an Australian state or a Canadian province can essentially say, we, we want it to accept some additional people beyond those that would be accepted by the uh, central government. Uh, often it's people in particular categories of professions or the like, or in the case of the province of Quebec, they want to get people who already speak French and therefore will be French speakers in uh, Quebec. Uh, and there are a number of proposals like this that have been floating around in the uh, US, including in the Democratic primaries recently, where Pete Buttigieg uh, adopted a proposal like this would actually be a, for local communities rather than states uh, where particular local communities could apply uh, the catches for several years. Uh, the person then have to work within that particular community uh, and which would limit their employment options. But after I think three years under that proposal, they would be able to move around freely. Uh, Joe Biden has also adopted a, a, a version of this. I think it's slightly different on some points. Meanwhile, uh, a couple years ago, uh, some Republicans in Congress actually put forward a proposal that would be for state-based visas, which is similar, but to my mind, better than 
a uh, one that's based on a local community in that it gives the migrant more employment options and residency options in an entire state, not just a particular community. Uh, and so the details of these proposals vary, but the basic idea is that some additional people would be admitted at the discretion of a state or locality. They, had, for a time at least, would only be able to live in that area or only be able to work in that area, but over time they could work their way towards a green card, which would give them uh, the ability to uh, live anywhere and work anywhere they want in the U.S. Even working in a particular state or locality might well be better than some current work visas which are tied to a specific employer, uh, which I think is much more restrictive. Uh, it's not, none of this is to my mind as good as you know, more full open borders where uh, you know, there should be a presumption of free migration for everybody, not at the behest of a national or state or local government. But this sort of decentralization can be a step forward. Uh, it has worked at least reasonably well in Canada and Australia. And there is real sentiment in Congress and in the political parties for it, though it remains to be seen you know, how the COVID-19 crisis will, will affect this. Uh, um, uh, obviously, you will get the objection, well, how can we let in immigrant workers if so many Americans are unemployed? I think this objection is flawed. Uh, from the standpoint of labor economics, but it's a, uh, a, a fairly common sentiment right now. Great. Uh, Daniel, do you have anything to add to that, or would you like to start taking uh, comments from the chat box? We've got a lot of great comments, too. Yeah, I'll, I'll add something really quickly, which is, um, uh, yeah, I mean, what I would add, the only thing I would add is um, that I am less um, troubled by the sort of temporary restriction in, um, in moving about the United States, um, mainly because the way you might think about it is, for instance, I'm in Chicago, um, and the Chicago metropolitan economy is the size of Switzerland, right? I mean, so, so a lot, because of the concentration of opportunity in large metro areas, and those tend to be, frankly, the areas most likely to issue, the V says, um, while I agree with Ilya that it's a restriction on choice, I think it's a relatively small one. Um, I think another way to think about this problem and, and sort of the advantage of local or state-based visas is to say, under current law, right, the states that dislike immigrants the most um, have basically veto power in the Senate over any reform legislation. Um, I think the local and state uh, visa policies can be a way to break through the kind of partisan gridlock that we have on this issue that is mainly the product of the overrepresentation of states um, with small populations and fewer immigrants that are keeping out um, or, or restricting the space for visas for states and localities that would be happy to welcome more immigrants, like the city of Chicago, for instance, which is actually uh, a domestic loser in the, in the, in the net migration wars, I mean, losing population to places like Texas and um, uh, other uh, states in the Sun Belt. Great, so the first comment, I'm just gonna read them as we get them. We're gonna to try to feed, get all of them. David, do you wanna read them off or do you want me to do it? Uh, go ahead, Fabio. Okay, so this is from Justin. Uh, what can we learn from the movements about abolishing police and jails? Um, how can those lessons be applied to the movement for reforming or abolishing borders and ICE and other agencies? I can speak to that, Ilya, do you, do you mind? Go ahead. Um, yeah, I think we can learn a lot. Um, you know, I think uh, abolish ICE is um, absolutely um, in, uh, in um, sort of out of the same stuff that Black Lives Matter is. And in fact, Black Lives Matter has explicitly linked its um, concerns about sort of um, ending state violence against Black people to um, uh, abolishing ICE and thus ending state violence against immigrants. And so I think the movements themselves are already self-conscious of the links between them. Um, and I think, you know, from my perspective, I think um, it just underscores the importance of this organization that we're all sort of participating in today, which is, you know, as Ilya pointed out, 
we're, we're way far away from anything like open borders in the United States. In fact, you know, now is a time where overnight all the borders are shut globally, which was previously um, an unthinkable possibility. Um, but I think it's important to have aspirations um, and it's important for social movements to think big. And I think certainly in the immigration context, which I'm a scholar of and I've followed for, you know, at least the last um, 10 years that I've been working on these issues, um, the story of immigration reform is that it has not happened and in fact has happened in the opposite direction. Um, and so I think the radical voices who are now becoming mainstream are right to think that um, reform along the usual paths, right? Like a few more visas here, um, you know, uh, visas for domestic or visas for temporary workers, etc. That's not going to be enough to really um, overturn everything that's wrong with the human restrictions that we see in the immigration system. And so, you know, I think I think they will be a powerful force. And my view is, and I, a lot of people don't agree with me, but my view is that these kind of radical proposals are important to put forward. Um, to, to keep people motivated and to um, to sort of make an incremental, you know, I, I think you can get into trouble when you say, well, we don't want any incremental reform. I think the right kinds of incremental reform, like the ones we've been discussing, are important to adopt. Um, but I think those big picture changes are important to articulate. So I have, I think, both agreement and some perhaps disagreement with what Dan said. I agree definitely that it's important to expand what uh, policy analysts called the Overton window of uh, sort of mainstream discussion that includes therefore talking about things like open borders even if we don't expect to achieve them at any time in the near future and also talking about sort of broad principles like some of the ones we talked about earlier about should your rights really depend on who your parents are and where you were born uh, and things of that sort. Uh, I also agree that purely incremental reforms will not fully eliminate uh, the injustices in the system, but I also think incremental reforms, at least for a long time, uh, are all that can in fact be achieved. And some of those incremental reforms may actually be fairly broad, even though they don't fully eliminate all the problems. On learning from police and prison abolition, I think there's both positive and negative lessons to be learned in here. Uh, I may differ a little bit from Dan in that I've actually written a little bit about the police reform recently uh, on the Bullock Conspiracy blog, the Reason website, where I've been writing about some of these issues for a number of years. And I think the idea of curbing police abuses uh, and holding them accountable is very popular. There is also some support for, uh, and growing support for eliminating punishment for uh, victimless crimes, nonviolent behavior and the like. On the other hand, complete abolition of police is highly unpopular. So is complete abolition of prison. I actually don't favor either of those things myself, but I can understand some people do. Uh, if so, they really have their work cut out for them. And I think uh, what we in this movement should, obviously we, we do favor some radical things which are unpopular and can't get away from that. But at the same time, it's important to draw a distinction between a violent behavior and nonviolent. So we can say, and we should say, it's, if you want to stop terrorists, violent criminals from moving around and so forth, go right ahead. And that's true for domestic as well as international terrorists and violent criminals. Just, but don't stop peaceful migrants. Uh, just like you can say you should legalize marijuana without necessarily saying, well, the activities of drug gangs are all fine when they engage in violence. Indeed, legalizing marijuana reduces those activities. Similarly, legalizing migration would reduce some of the violence and criminality associated with the border as well and with the existence of a black market. So I think we can definitely learn from the successes of other reform movements. I mentioned earlier, uh, movements for civil rights, for women's rights and others, but we should also avoid the excess of seeming to say like, well, you know, we, we want sort of disorder to run unchecked. We want, you know, we're different to possibilities of violence and uh, so on and so forth. I think uh, seeming that way or even worse, actually being that way, uh, you know, would re reduce the, the odds of success. Great. We're getting a lot of really fascinating comments. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read one or two more from the panel. And then as we close out the hour, I'll read the other comments or summarize them. And then you can continue this uh, through Twitter or whatever other uh, media you prefer.
So uh, Audrey asks, uh, if we were to meaningly move towards open borders, what implications might we see to our neighbors or globally? What would happen? Ilya, you want to start? Sure. So it depends, obviously, on how quickly we did it, we, we do it, uh, and in what circumstances. Uh, in my book, Free to Move, I talk about this at greater length, but there is this fear, well, if we suddenly open the borders, then there would be this flood of migrants who would be overwhelmed. I think such scenarios are overblown in that migration doesn't happen instantly. People need time for gradual movement and adjustments. Similarly, real estate and job markets would have to adjust, so it would be more gradual than that. Nonetheless, over a period of 10 or 20 or 30 years, there would be a big change, and it would be a change for the better, both for the migrants, uh, most of them, and for most natives as well. The migrants would get greater freedom and opportunity. We, in turn, would benefit from the enormous extra productivity that the migrants could generate, and that economists estimate that if there was full open borders throughout the world, world GDP would double. That is, the world would be about twice as wealthy as it currently is. Even if you think that's too optimistic, I go, uh, I have a discussion in my book about you know, why it might be too optimistic. Let's say it only increases, it doesn't double, it only increases by 20%. That's still an enormous gain and more an enormous gain for natives as well as for uh, migrants. So uh, I think, well, I'm not gonna say there would be zero costs or zero problems, but there would be these enormous gains and the gains could be used to mitigate any potential downsides. Uh, I talk about that in some detail in my book as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the questioner is pointing at um, a sort of set of objections to open borders that has less to do with individuals and more to do with the sending states, right? I mean, so so these are their folks um, in the UK, um, now I'm forgetting his name, but who write about sort of brain drain and sort of the um, concerns about um, what's uh, sort of the, the human population that's left in states that does not migrate. Um, so, I mean, there's, I think, two things I would say to that. One is, at some point, you have to kind of decide philosophically where you are. I mean, I, I basically decided I don't, I think restriction on migration is a sort of a violation of individual human rights. And I think that just trumps the collective rights. So even if these critics are correct, that, you know, um, the sending states will be harmed in some material way. Um, you know, I, I would still be willing to say that I think open borders are appropriate because of the restrictions on freedom that they impose on individuals. Now, I think the evidence though, and I think Ilya sort of pointed to this, is that that's not, that wouldn't necessarily be the case. For example, we already know because we have a big American experiment in, you know, quasi-ish, small-ish open borders because we have a 12 million strong undocumented population that has remained. In other words, we have a large population over and above what we have believed um, we could sort of handle through authorized visas. Um, and what, what do they do? They send remittances. They send, that is, a portion of the excess wealth they generate in the United States down to um, southern states. And in fact, a lot of those remittances are used in economic and property development in those countries. And so um, sort of economic remittances dwarf any development aid that currently exists. So I think you can reasonably expect that under an open borders scenario, you would find that there would be um, similar increases in development aid going down south. And so, so it could actually aid in the process of rendering countries um, economically in parity, right, in terms of their development indices. So that's one possibility. So I'm not pessimistic on um, uh, the um, effect on uh, sending countries, but um, others disagree. And, you know, those authors are out there. I'm just not one of them. This is another issue I talk about at some length in the book. Sorry? Oh, no, please continue, continue your thought, then I'll read the rest of the comments. Okay, no, go ahead. All right, so uh, we got a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to read these three comments out, and I'll ask the panel to respond to them uh, in, however they see fit. 
So Ellen says, thank you for the excellent panel. I want to hear a little bit more about how you think international law fits into the ideas you've been discussing. So it's an international law question. Sally asks, how can the immigrant advocacy community reinvigorate or reestablish diversity visa program as a priority? Uh, how can the immigrant advocacy community, uh, oh, good, that's right, repeat. And then uh, Jamila, who is a uh, also with the FMP, asks, what can we do at the higher education level as educators to demand a comprehensive immigration package? So international law, the advocacy community, and what can higher education do in terms of requesting a comprehensive reform? I can talk about international law briefly. Um, you know, I, I mean, my view of international law is that it is nation state, state centric. And, you know, I mean, the, the uh, decision, the Chinese exclusion case that Ilya was talking about, which was so terrible and racist, um, was purportedly anyway, grounded on 19th century ideas about state sovereignty um, that uh, were international legal norms, right? Or at least a, um, a uh, sort of internal characterization of those norms by the justices who made that decision. Um, and so, uh, you know, international law is state-centric. International law has a, I think, really um, counterproductive relationship to free movement um, in that um, because of its state-centric nature, it tends to reaffirm the privileges of those nation states among the most you know, jealously guarded of which is the right to exclude. So, um, you know, and then on, on, in the one area where international law has purportedly um, you know, made a big effort at free movement, which is in the specific character, you know, in the specific situation of asylum law, I think we've seen that international law has been, I don't, I don't want to say it too strongly, but, but quite a disaster, right? I mean, we have, um, we have Europe and the United States who are not taking anywhere near the amount of refugees that they ought to be taking under the regime. And there have been no, you know, uh, viable sanctions against um, that sort of maldistribution of refugees. The states that have the most refugees under the international system are those that can least afford them. Um, so, so personally, I am not a, um, I'm very skeptical of international law as a method to move us towards the regime that we all favor. I mean, that's why I talk more about bottom up. Um, and and I, I feel that that's true in the United States, but I also think it's true of Europe as well, where you see similar dichotomies where places like Berlin would love to have more immigrants and, you know, the former portions of East Germany um, would not. Um, and, and the East, you know, sort of the, those uh, less populated areas went out. Um, so yeah, international law, in my view, without significant reform, seems like quite a dead end to me to an open borders regime. Uh, so just briefly on this, I, I agree that international law probably isn't like some magic solution to these problems and that international law does embody a strong norm that states have a right to exclude. In my book, I do discuss how there is, however, already an, ex an exception to that for refugees defined relatively narrowly as people fleeing particular types of persecution, like on the base of race, uh, ethnicity, political views, and a few other things. Uh, and I argue for and as have other scholars for incrementally expanding that. That can be done as a general international treaty, but can also be done by agreement between uh, particular groups of countries and the like. Uh, it is not a replacement for other kinds of reforms, but it is an adjunct to it. Uh, and over the last 50 or 60 years, as a result of these international law norms, a number of countries, including the US, have passed uh, domestic laws protecting some categories of refugees. Uh, so uh, I point out that the distinction between so-called economic and political refugees that on which the system is based often is arbitrary and doesn't really make a lot of sense and that many economic refugees are in fact victims of uh, oppressive governments. Uh, I'm not sure if I remember the other two questions that were embodied in, in, in that comment. Uh, um, one I guess was about how, you know, what can the academic and intellectual community do to uh, improve things. Uh, Obviously, I think continue to call attention to it, but also to uh, lobby for change. Uh, they often have some clout in Congress and state legislatures and elsewhere. We saw some demonstration of that just recently where uh, the administration wanted to uh, say, well, students, foreign students who are on visas at universities where 
uh, you know, they go all online for the fall semester, that they would, that their visas would be stripped, and they would be expelled. And as a result of an outcry led by universities and others, uh, the administration had to backtrack on this. And also as a result of lawsuits that were filed. So this is a good example of the combination of legal and political action that I was talking about, albeit it was a relatively easy extreme case. There will be other situations which are more difficult. Thank you very much. We're at 2 p.m. There's a few more comments in the chat box. Please review those. You are uh, free to contact Daniel and Ilya over social media. They're both extremely active writers and scholars. They would love to hear from you, I'm sure. And we're at the end of the hour. Uh, this has been recorded, so this will be both on the Free Migration Project uh, Facebook site and their YouTube channel, so check for that in the days to come. And I personally uh, want to thank Daniel and Ilya. Maybe we could give them a virtual round of applause. So thank you very much. And I all wish you a healthy and safe day. And please uh, go to the Open Borders Action Group, the Free Migration Project Twitter feed, and our various social media outlets where we will be announcing uh, the October or November uh, Open Borders Conference. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. We are blessed to have these people talk to us. Be safe, and I'll thank see you guys later. later. Thank you all. Thank you. Great. Thanks for having me. Thanks to all of you for listening. Thank you.